Well, hello again. Yes, it has been a while, but you know, I'm getting ready for winter. I have a lot of things I need to do around the house. We were going to do the uh, carburetor today, and we will do the carburetor. <clears throat> I said we'd start out with the carburetor, but you know, there again, circumstances have altered cases. We're going to we're going to get to the carburetor, but first we're going to start out with the proportioning valve. Uh, I was going to order a new one and put it in and make it fit and all that. And it would have been an easy thing to do, but Brendan thinks I should look at the old one first, get inside of it, tear it apart. I said, well, I don't know what's in there. I, you know, I have no idea what's in there is even right. So he came up with a website that shows everybody what's in there. And uh, here it is. The website is uh, strangerssite.com. It deals with the proportioning valve called the Kelly Hayes. It was used on 64, uh, 65, 66 uh, Ford Mustangs as well as, of course, the Thunderbird. And uh, there's a whole thing about them right here. Uh, there were a lot of tolerance in that thing. They're nothing tight. Ford Motor Company uh, never put out a rebuild kit. They never expected them to be rebuilt. They were, they were a throwaway item when they're bad, they got rid of them and that was it. Now the uh, further down, if you have a Thunderbird now, you need to go to this page. Uh, brake proportioning valve. And uh, you can get it rebuilt if you want to go original. There's a guy out there who will do it uh, for close to a hundred bucks. So <laughs> it's up to you. He'll re-sleeve it, put all new parts in it. However, you can do it yourself. And uh, I'll show you here further down. Uh, this shows you what's inside of it, a spring, and this is your adjustment, your lock nut, and then your plate that's in the back end, your clip O-rings, <clears throat> and also there was an early and a late model. Uh, style A was your later version, and B, your earlier version. The difference is the shape of the plunger, okay? so. And there's no need for me to go much further on that. If you want to know about the, Hay the Kelsey Hayes proportioning valve, go to that website right there, okay? Well, now that we have some really good information to go on, uh, I don't know how, how Brendan found that, but he did. Uh, great information. We're gonna, I've decided to go ahead and try a rebuild kit like he recommended. I mean, what do you got to lose, you know? It doesn't, take, it doesn't hurt anything to go ahead and take it apart, this proportional valve. But first we'll have to remove the existing lines. This is the line that goes down toward the wheel uh, and the fender well, the long one, which is at the very end here. And this is the short line that goes up and connects to the, uh, it connects to the master cylinder, okay? It goes up in here. And right here on the other side, I believe it is, yeah, there's the bolt that fastens it to the fender. So, you know, what the heck. Let's go ahead and take the lines out. I'm going to have to use a pair of ice grips on those if I can't get them out with the wrench. They're pretty rusty. And uh, then we'll go ahead and just plunge this entire thing down in some vinegar and forget it for a week. And then we'll try to get this lock nut off and get the guts out and see what it looks like. You know, if the barrel of this thing is nice and smooth and not pitted or anything, this should be a piece of cake to rebuild. But if it's all pitted and all that, and he, I'm not going to go through the boring process and sleeving it and you know, honing it out like you would a wheel cylinder or a brake cylinder. It's just too much work. I'm just buying another one. But you know, what the heck? This is a uh, series where we tear things apart. We look at things. We examine things. Why not do it to this too? I have no problem with tearing things apart. You know that. <laughs> well, they came out pretty easy. Now, you have to use a, you know, a, a wrench like this. If you ever run into uh, fitting, you know, we, I, we used to call them B-nuts, I don't know what they're called now, flare nut or something. Anyway, if you run into one like this and it's got all kinds of, uh, you know, vice grip marks around it, it means that they used a non a wrench that did not look like this, which is wrapped almost all the way around it. They just use a standard wrench, whatever size it might be, and they rounded it off, which of course this is designed to prevent. Get yourself a set of these. This is a, uh, let me see, this one here is a 3-8 by uh, 7 16ths all right these are great you can't beat them they really do save on these kinds of uh, nuts of course we're going to get brand new uh, brake lines but if this were new you wouldn't want to be rounding this thing off because you'd have to wind up buying a whole new one just because you didn't have a wrench that you're supposed to be using get this this is very important for using uh, on these types of uh, nuts all right let's see if we can uh, 
get it in there and get some vinegar poured in a small container and let's see if we can just dump it in forget it for a while let's see what happens now I took a uh, wire brush to it knocked off all the loose rust I could I could get out and around that snap ring in particular now this thing is marked uh, you know it's got R and M uh, M means the master cylinder R means the rear of the car so it won't be any problem figuring out which line goes where and how long they need to be all right let's go ahead and set it down in the old vinegar just let it sit there for about a week it's been about a week. Let's take a look at our proportioning valve. Oh, nice dark water, or vinegar rather. Oh yeah, that's looking real good now. That is looking to see the end here. Yeah, that's the one I really cared about. That's where that snap ring is. And around here where I have to take that collar off, that locking collar, the rest is not too shabby. I think I'll leave it in there. I've got a couple of other things to do this morning, so I'll leave it in there. And I'll take it out in about an hour, and we'll take it in and wash it all down. Here's the results of our little de-rusting experiment on our proportioning valve. I went ahead and sprayed it with some uh, Ford blue spray paint that was graciously provided by our good subscriber, Ron C., quite a while ago. I wanted to keep it from rusting. It'll probably all be for in vain anyway. I'm going to go ahead and tear it apart as soon as I can get a vise that'll hold it. I don't have a vise. <laughs> I'll go down and probably bum my neighbors again i need to get you i have got to get advice i've got to get advice and i've just had other things that have been pressing of late all right folks what do you say we get this stupid carburetor on here finally well first we're gonna have to go ahead and remove all this stuff here i'm in the process of getting this off this entire hose will have to be replaced as i said in our last video and this one here will have to be relocated and then we're gonna have to put another one on that goes from this vacuum port up across the top and over to the uh, the uh, vacuum booster for the brakes. So let's get this one. I was finishing getting this one off. All right. Now this is what the original one looks like. It's on there. Only it's much longer. This part this part here has been cut off by <laughs> Mr. Master Mechanic. Anyway, the original part came out like this. It did not have this on it. I don't know what this is. So this may have come off another car and they just bent it over and flattened it out. <laughs> good good work there. They want $40 for that stupid hose at Max Thunderbird and they want $10 shipping. That's 50 bucks. That's not going to happen. That's way too much money for that hose. You know, which along with the shipping cost of $10, which it does not cost that much to ship it. So what we're going to do is we're going to come out with a line. We're going to measure. First, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to cut off this, this thing right here. This is called a long flare nut. And uh, this one here, I wanted to get another one. It was kind of rounded off right there. The rest of it's okay. It's an 11 16th, so the rest of it will work. But uh, I looked all over for this, and no one in town has one. I talked it over with Brendan. He said, yeah, that's, that's a long flare nut, and then they have a short one. He said, go ahead and reuse it if it's reusable. So I'm going to have to cut this baby off here. I couldn't find this anywhere in town. None of the hardware stores, none of the auto parts stores. I looked for uh, hydraulic lines, air conditioning lines, all kinds of stuff where I might have had one. No, but as a matter of fact, they all gave me that deer in the headlights look. I don't like that. And these guys are supposed to be professionals. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to cut that baby off, and we're going to go ahead and reuse this one. And we are going to reuse it on this line right here. This is a 3 8 line, same size as this one over here. And we're going to take off the uh, those brass nuts on both ends. I'm going to cut it, get you know, get the flare off of one end, take off both of these, and then we'll stick it in here like this, in there. And then I'm going to start bending it. Let me see if I can get it in the camera so you can at least see what I'm talking about. We're going to go ahead and stick it on there like that. Then we're going to bend it out. To, I'm going to use this as my reference point. I'm going to measure from here to here, give it a little bit more of a length and then I'm going to start my bend on this pipe about the same distance as about from here to the end of the flare nut and then we'll go ahead and uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bend it out it'll, it'll come out I'm going to go ahead and bend it to the uh, to the right as you look at it from the front we'll come across a little bit maybe kind of go in a little ways come across and then come out a little ways 
and see where that takes us maybe over to the hose. I don't know, I'm gonna play this one by ear. I've seen it done a couple of different ways. Now let me show you what we're gonna bend this thing with. I think I showed it, showed it to you once, I'll show you again. We'll be using these two bender pliers. Uh, they come with two round things that are changeable. This is a half inch nut. And you can see, you can see I can bend, uh, I can bend three eighths inch tube, five sixteenths. And the other wheel they give you is three sixteenths and a quarter, depending on the size of the, of the uh, tube you're bending. Each, each of those are different sizes, as you can see. But we're gonna be doing three eighths. And uh, once I get these, uh, these uh, little bee nuts, I don't know what we used to call them. I call them bee nuts. Let me back up here a little bit. We used, when, once I get these off, I'll be able to get it close up to the end. And it's just a matter of squeezing this thing. It's not too easy with these 3 8 inch tubes, but it can be done. You just got to take your time, go slow. You know, it just occurred to me that some of you may not, may not know what a uh, tubing cutter is. Now, this is a small one. They come in all different sizes, great big giant ones to these little ones. I like the little one because sometimes I had to get up into an engine and cut off a line and the big ones would have never gone around and around. But this little baby has been with me for years and years. It's perfect. It's got a little cut, sharp cutting wheel. It's that wheel spins down in here. You can, let me see, you get a zoom in here where you can see it a little better. It has a little, little cutting wheel down there, pretty sharp edge on it. And that presses against one side of the tube and this little sunk in spot is just there to hold the other side of the tube in place while the wheel does the cutting and this is a, a little like a little vise it just closes it up on the metal and what you do is you close it up on the tube then you run it around with your finger a couple of times and then you tighten this up a little bit more and then you run it around again and it begins to cut a slot or a real sharp just a line through the tube each time you tighten it up and spin this thing around the tube, uh, it'll be held in place by that, that little sunk in area there. And the wheel just gets tighter and tighter and you keep going around and around, it cuts into the metal. I'll give you a little demo here. All right, there, I've got it in there and I've already tightened up the, uh, the handle pretty tight. And then I ran it around a couple of times, you begin to see that wheel cutting that little groove into the metal. Now I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll tighten it up a little bit more with my hands. And then I'll hold the tube with one hand, use this, and go round again. And eventually it'll just cut completely through it, and, and uh, the end will just fall right off. Uh, along with the tool, of course, then you got to take the end out of the tool. But that's a tubing cutter. As you can see, the slot's getting deeper and wider. The tighter I tighten up that thing there and spin it around, the deeper the, deeper the little wheel cuts. And you can see that it has now finally cut all the way through. And there it is. That's how it works. Pretty cool, huh? We should have invented that years ago, right? Now, normally, you know, when you have a, you've cut off an end like this, it's usually just to make it nice and straight. Usually you don't cut off, you know, a flared end unless you have to. I have to on this. But uh, you, uh, you, you, if you have like a, a bent or jagged line, you can cut it off nice and flush like that, nice and square and then re-flare the end with a flaring tool to make it look like this. So you have a flare on the end. And then of course you do have jagged edges. You have to make sure that you take a little sandpaper and kind of knock off the jagged edge inside and out. Normally the bigger tools have a little like a pointed arrow thing that you slide out with your thumb and then you stick it down in the hole and you ream it out a couple of times and that takes care of the, uh, the jagged uh, edges on the inside of the hole uh, from the uh, cutting. And then on the outside, you just knock it off with a little sandpaper. So we'll be doing both. I'll probably use my pocket knife, you know, to knock off the jagged edges, make sure no metal gets down in there. You know, you want to make sure it stays nice and clear of all metal shavings. Then I'll knock off the outside. Now we take off these brass fittings. And we put this one on. Now don't forget, if you ever have to do this, and you have to use a you know a nut off of another rod. Don't forget to put your uh, your uh, to do the flare nut on there, or whatever kind of nut you got. Get it on there first before you start your bends. If you don't get it on there first and get it up against this flare, and then you start doing your bends. Once it once that tube is bent, you will never. If you say, oh God, I forgot to put it on. Once the tube is bent, that's it. It's over. You'll never get it back on.
I've decided to put our first bend about three and a quarter inches from the end of the flare to the center of the wheel. And I've marked it on there with a black mark. I don't know if you can see that or not. So I've, I've discovered from bending other lines with it, you got to kind of practice with it. You normally lose about a quarter of an inch in the bend. Uh, so essentially uh, when we're done, I guess we'll have about three inches. If we maintain a quarter inch, it won't make any difference. Again, you know, I could maintain an entire inch if I wanted to. I, before I start to bend, I may just go up to three and a half inches and then start. Well, that turned out to be a total bust. I am not happy at all. This tool did not work. Because the line, boy, I tell you, it's difficult to bend this 3 8 line. Look at look at the kink it put in there. Well, that totally sucks. So I had to wind in order to get the, of uh, course, to get the, the flare nut off. I have to use it again. I had to wind up cutting the flare end off the other the other end of the tube. So that ruined the tube. But what I have decided to do, I decided, well, why not just take what's left of the tube and practice with it? So I bent it again, and guess what? Another kink another kink so I think what's going to have that that tells me something now I'm going to have to get maybe a copper line or something that tool is not supposed to do that I'll tell you it's very difficult to, to squeeze that thing together on a 3 8 line really tough we may be temporarily stopped on the bending of that too but we are not stopped in our endeavor here because all I'm trying to do today is clear up the linkage so we can get that carburetor on. We can hook this up and uh, bend it at any time, but we got to get it clear of the linkage. So we're going to work on this hose right here. This hose is next. We got to get it off of there. Now this hose is rated at 50 psi. That's on the car here. I went out and I've got new hose that I'm going to put on it. We're going to take this off. We're going to put a hose on there. It's transmission cooling line hose. It's rated at 400 psi. Uh, Brennan and I talked it over. 50 psi just didn't seem to be enough, so I went down to O'Reilly Auto Parts and uh, talked to my buddy Zach down there. He's the manager, and we wound up with some 400 psi hose. Uh, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and take that hose off of there, and I'm going to take the other end off the pump, and we're going to we will install this hose right here in this place. I'll have to cut it to length, of course. So while I'm doing that, why don't you have a, a look at this? I'm at my favorite uh, auto parts store, O'Reilly, and this is the car that belongs to the manager, Zach. Say hi, Zach. Hey. hey. <laughs> nice car. I was on my way to the hardware store today, and I drove by, and there it was. And I said, oh, man, I got to stop, because we've always talked about this 57 two-door hardtop, but I've never seen it in the flesh until now. Boy, that is really nice, Zach. That thing got air conditioning in it too, doesn't it? It does. Holy mackerel. Let's see if I can zoom in here. I don't know how to use I'm using my iPhone. If I didn't know he was here, I'd have brought my camera. <laughs> can you open it up and yeah. take a look at it? Man, you've even got the original uh, lock buttons on it. You know uh -huh. that, don't you? <laughs> they were kind of a rubber texture, and my son's uh, kind of stripped. Column. That's what my boy wants to do. He wants to put it back on the column. You know, that is, that is just so cool. Now that uh, air conditioning, is that factory? No. Okay, so you installed that. Yeah. Well, we had it installed. That that's great. That's the so this is aftermarket, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. That that's really nice, boy. This looks good, huh? Very, very nice. Did you have the upholstery done locally? Back in Fort Smith. Fort Smith. Yeah. Oh wow. Man, this is nice. It's got the original 283, you said, it right? Is. Oh, that's great. That's great. This looks very, very nice. You know, that grill bar, the only thing, like I said, I was telling you one day the original uh, the original parking lights were clear. clear. But that looks good, just yeah. the way it is, okay? But uh, the, that grill bar, my son and I we go, went all the way to the uh, uh, Pennsylvania to find a grill bar. We found one at a big giant flea market up there. Well, he paid a hundred and I think it was a hundred and fifty dollars for this because it had the emblem in it, plus it had the uh, the parking light lenses and the, the wires and attachments on the bag was complete, complete. You know, it wasn't. He didn't have to buy each part individually. Yeah, that looks really nice. Well, now there's only one thing left to do. You know what that is, don't you? What's that? Vroom, let's hear it start, son. <laughs> Come on, let's hear it. I want to hear this baby roar. 
If I, if I put this on my YouTube video and, and they don't hear it run, I'm going to hear it forever. <laughs> What kind of mufflers you got on it? Flow masters. Flow masters. Yeah, I like that sound. Oh. That's a nice thing. How long have you had it? Uh, it's been in the family since I was probably about five or six years old. Okay, who owned it? Your dad? My dad. And he passed it on to you? Yep. Did he buy it new? No. Well, still, that's, uh, you know, that would have been, he drove it for a number of years, didn't he? He did. Did yeah. he help you with the restoration and all that? Uh, it was... He had it restored shortly after he bought it. Um, it was originally a white car. Oh, really? Um, you know, he's changed a few things. It's got a turbo 250 transmission in it. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the power glide. So there's a few bucks in this car, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, and it always helps to work at a nice auto parts store, doesn't That's it? That's right. To manage an auto parts store. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you much. We appreciate you that. You're a fine fella. I hope you enjoyed that little ditty. I sure did. Why do I have a ratchet with an extension going down into this uh, tube right here? This 3 8 inch line is going to be connected on to our reservoir on the steering box. Well, I'll tell you what, if you look down in here, it took me forever to get, to get that, uh, right down here, that silver end has a flange on it. And that, that pipe is 3 8 of an inch, but the flange is larger. And I can't get this rubber hose over the top of that flange. Now I put a little bit of, you know, power steering fluid down inside, and I put a little power steering fluid on the end of that flange, and it still didn't want to cooperate. So having had this problem in the past, I had to—I knew I have to stretch the end of the hose out a little bit. So the only way to do that is to find something a little larger than that flange, and it turns out to be our little extension here. And you just sort of just ratchet it down in there. I only took it down to about this far enough to stretch the uh, the uh, the end of the uh, hose out a little bit and you know let it sit for a little while and it'll stretch out and kind of relax a little bit and then I might be able to force it over the end of that flange and then get it on down there and uh, slide the clamp up right here and get the clamp around it that's the only thing holding up our our little hose uh, venture here of course you know if you have a drop light you can always set it real close to it and that'll kind of make the the uh, hose a little more pliable, you know, and kind of bend it to your will. Just don't leave it on there forever. Well, that's what we've got so far, and uh, it's up high enough to clear the uh, the rod from the carburetor and all that. But I want to put a, uh, a later on. I'm going to have one made or fashion one up myself. It's going to be a heater hose support bracket, even though this is uh, uh, lines for the you know the windshield wiper. If I, I can get a, a I'll fashion one after a heater hose support bracket, probably, you know, hook it maybe to this bolt. There's a bolt down in here. I can put it on maybe that one right over there. If I can zoom in here a little bit. Let me see. There's a little bolt down in there. I can maybe hook it to one of them, two bolts there. And You know, once we get the car running, if that ever happens in my lifetime, <laughs> uh, you know, we'll come back and redo some of the cosmetic issues, some of the changes and everything. The whole idea now is to change out the old stuff, get in the new, and try not to delay too much. But it has, still has to be good, you know, it still has to be right. Okay, now we're uh, up to this little booger right here. In the last video, I put up a request uh, to anyone out there who owned uh, one of our, you know, one, uh, one or more of our subscribers who owned a 66 Thunderbird or 65, maybe even a 64, to, you know, send me some pics or post some pics or photos of how the gas line and the brake line runs from the rear of the car up to the front of the car, up behind the, maybe, maybe up behind the splash shield. Those of you who watched the video know what I'm talking about. We had tremendous response. Uh, I really appreciated that. Uh, but old George, old George, where is George from? My buddy George. George is from Michigan. George not only sent photos of the gas and the brake line and how they, how they run up behind the splash shield in the left front fender, but he also sent some really, really nice linkage photographs. Check these out, will you? He showed for the carburetor, you know, and boy, I tell you, it cleared up a lot of questions on that linkage. This, he did this job, he said, a few years ago or something uh, when he first got his Thunderbird. I think that's what he said. 
And boy, I'll tell you what, he did a great job. Look at that thing. These are beautiful photos, too. Here's another one. Shows you exactly how that linkage is supposed to be put together. And of course, I have all the parts to do it. And this really helps getting something like this. There's another photograph. I'll tell you what, I really appreciate that. This was a big surprise when this came in. I said, wow, that solves all my problems. Now I've been trying, this thing here was mounted on the front, if you'll remember in the last video. They mounted it on the front and then hooked a uh, spring through this hole and they hooked it to the long rod that came out from here to uh, pull, pull back on the, uh, the carburetor uh, linkage there, throttle uh, rod. And, you know, I'm glad they saved this. You know, they could have thrown it away and just put some kind of piece of wire up there somewhere. But they saved this, and which is great. They took it from the rear of the engine. Now, I've been trying to get it in here, you know, something like this here. Let me get the light over here where we can see what we're doing. All right, I've been trying to get it down in here some way to where it would go like this. And it, no matter what I did, it wouldn't work. So I'm thinking, well, maybe they got this off another engine. But that was before we got those great carburetor photos. This thing, I had it upside down. What it's supposed to do is it goes around the other way with this pointed thing up. And it lays right down there in that valley. And there's a bolt right here that I have to remove. Right here where my, uh, where is it at? Right here. Right here where my finger's at. This thing will lay right down in there like that and it'll lay flat on the engine and the hole will be directly below where it's supposed to be so I can hook up the spring. So right now I need to remove this bolt and get this thing bolted in. All right, so far so good. Now we're gonna go ahead and remove this nasty old, now this is probably in good shape, but I wanna get rid of it because I already have a nice new one. We're gonna put this nice new one on. Now it's held, it's held onto that uh, lever back there with a, a C-clip or E-clip they call it. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and just take a little, little screwdriver, stick it in there like that, and just pop that clip right off of there. And hopefully it won't fall down into the engine, which it probably will. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit of grease and put it around there. I'm going to pull, I just have it sitting in there right now. I'm going to pull it back, put a little bit of grease around there, a little, little bit of grease in the hole. Not much, just regular old grease in a can, you know, I'll take it out with my finger. You don't want to gob a lot of grease there. This is the engine compartment. A lot of dirt gets blown up into it while you're driving, and, you know, it'll collect on that grease. So you just want to, just a little film of it, you know, to help that help that thing move a little smoother. And uh, once I get it all done, I'll go ahead and put the new clip back on. Now, I managed to save the old clip, and I'm glad I did. And this is a lesson learned for you young folks. Many times I've uh, removed a clip and threw it away or just, it on the floor or whatever I just couldn't remember what I did with it and when I got ready to put the new clip on it, it flipped off and went somewhere down the engine and I couldn't find it and <laughs> the new one you know so now I can't find the new one and I can't find the old one to put on it I'm always in a fix doing that so I've learned over the years to try to keep the old one until the new one is on okay <laughs> try to you know do your best to keep that old one because you don't know if you're going to need it in order to make that holly probably give a good seal, what they had to do was use two gaskets on this thing. This one's sitting on top of the uh, base plate gasket, so we're not going to do that. We're just going to go back to the single gasket, which will give us a nice tight seal. But first, we're going to go ahead and spray this with some contact cleaner and give it a good cleaning with a rag. It, it needs it bad. It's really uh, kind of messed up. Take a, just a nice clean rag and get it nice and clean, get it as clean as we can with the spray. It may take two or three times. Well, that looks pretty good. It's nice and clean and smooth now. Now, one thing uh, I want everybody to remind me of at a later date, just in case I forget. See that vacuum port coming out of the bottom of that, that, that spacer? That thing uh, never had a cap on it. And it's been an open uh, vacuum. I don't know how the engine ran real good. I guess it's just, just enough to get them where they wanted to go. No big deal. But uh, that thing needs to be capped off or used for something. I'm not sure which. So don't let me forget to put a rubber cap over the top of that thing at a later date. Hopefully I won't forget, but I'm going to give it just a little more cleaning on this. By the way, this is not the engine. This is the spacer. This is the spacer. You've got a gasket between the spacer and the intake manifold. Then you got your spacer. 
Then you got another gasket between the carburetor and the top of the spacer. Don't forget that anytime you're working on these uh, 390 engines. At long last, folks, something that a lot of you have been waiting for for quite a while. I wanted everybody to see it when I did it. We're going to set the carburetor. Got the gasket on. I'm going to set the old carburetor back on the engine. Come on, baby, don't mess me up here now. There we go. There we go. Now, doesn't that look cool? That looks really cool. Let's zero in on it there. Okay, I'm going to adjust it down and get it so it sits good and get the bolts or get the nuts on rather well you know what they say nothing can be easy with this car <laughs> i had it on there but it wouldn't go all the way down comes to turn come to find out one of these bolts here is uh is a little kind of crooked a little bit and it just won't drop down on top of those bolts normally it just sits right down you know so what i'm going to do is take this little rat tail file there may be some burrs down in here that i need to work out which i shall do it sounds like my phone and now comes this little part here, and uh, this thing here, uh, it's kind of an interesting little deal. I've seen them before. You squeeze them together, and uh, it releases from the threaded area. Isn't that cool? Just squeeze it together, and it releases. And then when you put it back on, you push it, you squeeze it together again, and shove it up to where you want it, and release it, and it locks it right in place. This thing here will go through here, like so and into here like so and then we'll put a we'll put a nut on the other end there well so far so good now i'm going to go ahead and hook the spring that uh that thing with the hole in it that i bolted on earlier this hooks through the hole and this comes up and goes over the top it goes between these two things right here on that spot right there See if I can zoom in here. There you go. It'll go right between those two uh, hex nuts there. I had the wrong spring uh, I tried to put in there. This is the uh, kick down rod return spring. And this one here is a lot longer. This one would have worked, but it would have been stretched to the max. <laughs> so this is your uh, accelerator return spring here. Hooks to that thing down there that I bolted in, you'll recall. And then it just goes up and lays over the center there. It's fantastic. Just, and just when you when you uh, when you uh, step on the gas, it brings it back. Now we have to hook up the uh, uh, the uh, kick down rod return spring. This is your kick down rod right here. I've still got to put a, a connector on the other side and grease it up a little bit. And then uh, this thing here had to be bolted on. I had to remove that nut and bolt that on right there. This will go. I believe it goes this way or this way and it'll hook to this hole. There's a hole. See that hole right there in that rod? Right there. It'll hook that hole to that rod over to this hole in this uh, thing right here. So whichever way it is, I shall show you. I think, I think the long part goes here, but probably not. <laughs> All right, folks, that's all she wrote. Everything is now hooked up, and that's the way you hook up a 4100 carburetor to a 66 Thunderbird with the new linkage, the new springs, and everything. Now, the one thing is probably uh, I'm probably going to have to still do is that kickdown rod. That E-clip is pretty much worn out. I'll probably knock that one off and, and go downtown and buy a new one and replace it. I mean, it, I know where I can get them. They're a dime a dozen. So that's about it. Uh, I wanted to get to the gas line and the brake line in this video and I didn't make it however I'm going to show you a series of photos uh, that our good subscribers sent me which really helped and showed me exactly where the gas line and the brake lines go and I'll make a few comments I'll put them up on my computer screen I'll make a few comments on, on, the, on the folks that did it we had very good response on my request for that and I really appreciate all you guys that helped out you know all these folks own Thunderbirds I don't remember hearing from very many of them <laughs> you, you got to keep me motivated here fellas keep me motivated don't let me uh, think I'm the only guy in town with a T-bird anyway I do appreciate everything they did we're going to pop them up on my computer screen I'll make a few comments and we'll go ahead and close out this video some of you wanted a long video well, you're going to get one I just said to heck with it I'm going to stay with it 
until we get our old carburetor in there. Now, doesn't that look better? That looks really nice, doesn't it? Now, I still have to come up with something to, to hold this up. It's not in the way. It's not in the way, but I want to have something. Uh, I, can, I can bolt something down here or something over there that'll just lift it up and keep it, you know, gen gently up like that. It doesn't have to be too much. Well, I'll come up with something. Not a big deal. All right. Uh, it's getting pretty late outside. I'm starting to get a little bit hungry. The uh, sun's going way down. Let's get in the house where I can uh, grab a bite to eat. Go ahead and uh, uh, show you the stuff on the computer, and then we'll close it out. Now for all of our good subscribers and T-Bird owners who responded to my request. We'll start out with Mike out in Southern California. That's old Mike right there. He's uh, having a little nap in his, in his driveway. He doesn't want anybody to touch his Thunderbird, so he sleeps in there. They say he hasn't slept for quite a while, trying to keep it in good shape. So, <laughs> Here's a photo Mike provided. It looked really nice. He, nice. He's got a nice clean car up underneath there, too. And uh, this shows the, ga the uh, gas line for sure coming out from behind the splash shield. I wasn't sure whether it came up, you know, I came out of the bottom and then ran up on the inside of the splash shield like this and then down and around. But this clearly shows it does not. It does run in back of the splash shield. And uh, it runs down, bends down, and then here's where it meets the uh, brake line coming from the master cylinder. Comes down, the master cylinder brake line goes down to the front caliper. And there's a double clip right here that holds both the gas line and the brake line. Now here's a photo from our good subscriber Ted in uh, Utah. Uh, after the line uh, comes down from the master cylinder, uh, it comes across here like this and uh, for the you know for the uh, caliper comes across here like this then bends up and around and it connects to a, a bracket right there that's where the flexible line picks it up so mine's gonna have to have a nice bend in it just like that after it comes here it is coming down from the master cylinder I showed you in the previous video or the previous photo comes down runs along this little rail here and around like that. By the way, there's the gas line. The gas line also runs here, then it goes underneath here, and it runs, there's a rubber flexible hose that goes from there to the fuel pump. Now here's a photo I was very glad to get from William. I was, I was really hoping someone would send this to me. This is the bottom of the car where the gas line and the, and the uh, the brake line come from the rear of the car up this is the rocker panel here comes from the rocker panel it comes up and it goes underneath the splash shield right here the splash shield comes down and it covers this area right here mine and another <coughs> one of our other subscribers who sent a photo they are smashed completely in this entire all this metal you see here is, is smashed completely up against here where the car is bottomed out on something but when I took my uh, splash shield out, I hammered it all out. And I wasn't sure whether it was supposed to stay that way or, or, or was it supposed to be smashed up in there to, <laughs> to keep it from bottoming out and, and messing up the, uh, the, the gas line and the brake line. I'm glad to see that uh, Williams right here is really in good shape because it, it, it shows that when I, when I hammered it out, I did it right. That's what you're looking for up underneath the rocker panel where the where the two lines come from the rear of the car. You don't want this metal smashed up against there. It's not right, okay? That was a good photo. I appreciated that. Now this photo came from Andy. Uh, he was one of the first to uh, respond. And one is the, uh, he's showing, it's difficult to see, so he put these red lines on here, how the uh, gas line runs uh, from out from behind the splash shield. Now keep in mind, I really appreciated him doing this because being the first, I think he was the first one to respond. Uh, he he wasn't he, he wasn't aware that I was getting other responders uh, to you know, to my request. So I really appreciated him taking the time and writing and putting in the red lines here to show you. Because once after he did this, then the next one started coming in, and I could see that yes, they're all the same. So he kind of set the set the stage for the rest. I appreciated that. Now this one came in from Jamie, and this was another good one. His was the first one that had the splash shield removed. And boy, I'll tell you what, that really cleared up a few things. I was under the impression right here 
that this line here being the brake line, I thought that was a rubber hose right there connecting this part of the brake line to where it goes down underneath the rocker panel. And it's not, that is an actual brass fitting. So there's no, no, uh, no uh, rubber brake hose or anything right here. It's a brass fitting, it comes up and it uh, worms around, it comes up, worms its way around and it goes behind the fender here up to the proportioning valve, the proportioning valve up in there. So the proportioning valve, uh, it takes the line from the master cylinder to the proportioning uh, valve and then the other side of the proportioning valve, it comes out and goes down into the rear of the car. Now the gas line right here does in fact have a rubber hose that connects the underneath side. I'll show you that once we get to that in our next video. There's a little rubber hose that comes around here like this and then this comes up and comes around and then again you know down and around and the other brake line coming with it and on, on down over to the fuel pump. So that, that was cool. That showed the exact layout behind the splash shield. That was really cool. Last but not least, here you can see where the, this was a photo from Mike also. Mike uh, sent several photos as I've stated. He also sent a video, which, which was real nice. We have a whole lot of pictures that came in, but I didn't show them all, you know, just, in, uh, just to keep things reasonably short. A lot of them were the same, and I was glad to see that because there was a comparison. Uh, you know, there was some slight deviations on how it was done in, in the various cars. But overall, it was identical. Uh, here's where the lines come in. This is your brake line. There's your brass fitting right there. Now my brass fitting is down here a little bit because this line's been replaced. But I'll go ahead and run. I'll just hook in here with a, the, you know, with a brake line and run it right on up. And it goes on up into the uh, proportioning valve. And this is the rubber hose that comes from the gas line. It comes out from underneath. They put that rubber hose with a couple of clamps and then run it up, down, and around, of course, like you saw. So that's it, and I appreciate everybody, everybody who pitched in and helped out on that. So we all know what that means. A shout out to Mike, Andy, George, William, Ted, and Jamie. And hopefully I didn't miss anybody. Until next time, this is John.